chapters. I feel like I say that about all the chapters. All right, but I really do enjoy, enjoy talking about chapter 14 because there's so many things that I wanted to talk about in chapter 13 as I'm going through certain structures, especially when we're doing the brainstem that I didn't get a chance to talk about. So let's talk about the inferior structure to your brainstem, right? The other part of the central nervous system, that is your spinal cord. And so let's talk a little bit about the spinal cord, what it does, its functions, and then we'll get into uh, some of the interesting uh, pathways, conduction pathways, as we call them. So when we're talking about the spinal cord, we're gonna include some of the spinal nerves here. So of course, think of the spinal cord right, as that connector between your brain and the periphery or the rest of your body. So you're gonna get here, and I know I've mentioned this before, sensory input from the body. So that means input is going to come into the body through the receptors and travel up through the spinal cord and into the brain. And then also, all right, the um, spinal cord will serve to send motor output or motor commands from the brain down to your body. So today we're gonna to talk about what the spinal reflexes are. Right. Spinal reflexes are just that. They're reflexes that involve the spinal cord only and not the brain. And so we're going to see some of the characteristics. We're going to see how quickly uh, a spinal reflex occurs. And in most cases, a spinal reflex will occur before you even notice anything happening. So let's look at the spinal cord and our spinal nerves. A couple uh, structures worth noting. I'll even zoom in here a little bit. I love this picture here. All right. You can see here, right? our white matter on the outside, the gray matter on the inside. Now this picture is showing, all right, the sensory information is the blue line here. That's gonna be the sensory neuron. All right, and that's gonna bring your sensory input into the spinal cord. So we'll enter in through the spinal nerve, all right? And then you can see, all right, there's two parts to the spinal nerve. You have the anterior root and the posterior root. The posterior root carries sensory axons only. The anterior root carries motor axons only. So by the time we get to where it splits here at the spinal cord, right, sensory is gonna go into the spinal cord through the posterior or back door as I call it. And then motor commands are gonna come out the front of the spinal cord out to your body here. Now you'll notice here immediately as we're getting uh, gaining access to the sensory, or excuse me, to the posterior root, we have this bulge here. That's our posterior root ganglion, or also known as the dorsal root ganglion. That's where all the cell bodies are. Because a ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Does anybody have an idea, or can anyone that's paying attention uh, type in what we call a cluster of cell bodies in the central nervous system? Does anybody recall that? Because we will be talking about that today, All right? A cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system is known as a ganglia. What about a cluster of cell bodies in the central nervous system? What do we call that? Anybody have an idea? Oh, we got an answer here. That's what I'm talking about, David. You're absolutely correct. A nucleus, good, awesome. All right, so you're gonna do well, right? When we start going over some of the conduction uh, pathways here. So notice for our sensory receptors that are located in the periphery, we have two types, and we're gonna get into this in a few moments, somatic and visceral. All right, somatic are gonna be things that you can consciously perceive. So that includes touch, all right, pressure, vibration, proprioception. Visceral will be below your level of consciousness. This is happening all the time, okay? That includes baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Baroreceptors are located in, in, in like your blood vessels. They monitor your blood pressure, how much pressure or stretch is going on in the blood vessel wall. Chemoreceptors are monitoring all right, the concentration of substances in your blood. Then when we get to the effectors, you know there's only three types of, excuse me, there's uh, two types of effectors, muscle and glands. And then there's three types of glands. Or, golly, I can't think tonight. There's three types of muscle. All right, so when we're talking about our effectors, we have visceral, also known as autonomic, and somatic. 
start with the easier one first. Somatic are going to be the voluntary effectors. And the only type of voluntary effector that you have. Oh, good. Christina, thank you very much for letting me know. I appreciate that. Glad you could make it. The um, uh, somatic are voluntary. So the only type of voluntary effector you have is skeletal muscle. So that means all the other type of effectors fall under visceral, autonomic involuntary control. And that includes cardiac and smooth muscle and glands. Okay, so it's, this, is, it's, this is a good picture to kind of just have a general understanding. And I really strongly urge you to learn, all right, or at least have a, a good working knowledge of this picture here. So we're going to start talking about the conduction pathways. All right, these are these tracks that move up and down through all right, your spinal cord up to the brain and then these tracks that come down. So quick review here, spinal pathways are going to be either sensory or motor. Sensory pathways go up towards the brain, so they ascend. So we also call those ascending pathways. And motor pathways originate in the brain and then come down out to the periphery. So they are going to descend from the brain. So another name for those types of pathways are descending pathways. So let's talk about some of their characteristics here. You need to know these, they'll help you as we go through this chapter, okay? So pathways are gonna be paired, meaning you have one on the right and one on the left. And these pathways are gonna be made up of axons. So we pretty much recall what the axon anatomy is, cell body, axon, dendrites, all right, synaptic knobs. But primarily we're gonna be discussing all right, the axons and the cell bodies here. So where are these cells located? All right, so the axons are gonna be found in the spinal cord, we call those tracts. The cell bodies are gonna be found in the ganglia. So they're gonna be in the periphery. We'll also see them, all right, when we're into our central nervous system, we're gonna see them in the spinal cord, gray horns. What's the gray horns, Dr. Kaz, right here. This is the posterior gray horn. This is the anterior gray horn. And then you've got your lateral gray horn right over here. We'll go over that in much more detail when we get into the lab for the spinal cord, okay? So if you don't know it now, don't worry, you will. And then the other uh, uh, location for cell bodies is going to be in the gray matter up in your brain. And that includes the cerebral cortex, for example, or any of the numerous nuclei that are located throughout all right, your brain. All right, so these pathways are going to be made up of, at a minimum, two neurons. But it'll be two or more neurons. Could be three, could be four. Okay, but the pathway will have a minimum of two neurons. All right, so two or more neurons make up the pathways. Now, when we started talking about the brain, we discussed how one cerebral hemisphere will control the opposite side of the body. So th the reason why is because these pathways that we're going to uh, talk about here in a few moments are going to decusate. You need to know that term. Basically, decusating is when these axons will cross from one side of your body to the other side of the body. They are going to cross what we call the midline. And so the, if these axons are descending from the right cerebral hemisphere, they're going to cross over to the left side of the body. And so they're going to process that information or transmit that information to the contralateral side. Contralateral means opposite side. Ipsilateral is the same side. Now we'll see that most of these paths, pathways will decusate. They'll cross over. Some and we'll talk about those, some don't decusate. They remain on the same side. And so we say those are ipsilateral. They'll stay on the same side of the body there. All right, so let's talk about our sensory and motor pathways. We'll start off with the sensory pathways. By now, you're probably gonna get tired of me saying this, but you should already know this. The, these pathways are gonna provide sensory input, all right, to the brain up to the, in, in, I'm sorry, to the brain, yes, but up and through the spinal cord. And so these, the sensory input comes from what we call general sense receptors. All right, so we have general sense receptors and special sense receptors. I hate to do this to you, 
but we will talk about the difference between those types of receptors more in chapter 16 when we talk about special senses. But for right now, just understand that general sense receptors are, there's two types, the somatic sensory, okay? and if it's somatic, that means we have conscious perception of this. So there's two types of somatic sensory. We have tactile, which is basically touch. Okay, we can detect the characteristics of some sort of object that you're touching, if it's hard, if it's hot, if it's smooth, all right, if it's furry, okay, if it's rough, those are our tactile receptors. The other type of somatic sensory receptor are proprioceptors. And basically, they're going to be located around joints. And their job is to monitor and detect stretch in the joints and the tissues of the joints. That includes muscles and tendons. So essentially what proprioceptors are going to do is they're gonna tell your brain what your joint is doing. It'll tell you if the joint is flexing, if it's extending, if it's supinating, pronating, dorsiflexing, all right? It tells it all that information and it tells you the brain how much. Okay, your brain doesn't read it at 37 degrees of flexion, but that's essentially what will happen. So if you bend your knees at 37 degrees, or 45 degrees of flexion, right, that information right, gets transported or transmitted to your brain. And it knows what's going on without even having to look there. All right, it's wonderful, wonderful process, more detail later on. All right, the other type of general sense receptor are our visceral sensory receptors. These are the ones that you don't really have conscious perception of, right, but they will detect changes in our viscera. What's a viscera? An organ. I love to use the stomach as an example. All right, stretch receptors are located throughout the stomach. So as you start to ingest food or liquid, it starts to fill the stomach up and pushes on the walls of the stomach. That stretch will trigger all right, reflexes to init not initiate, but to digest the contents there of the stomach and do some other all right, uh, uh, physiological functions in the digestive system. You get to learn about the beauty of all of that, right, in bio 211. Okay, but our visceral sensory receptors will detect changes. Stretch is one, all right, we talked about the baroreceptors in your um, blood vessels, also those chemoreceptors in the blood vessels too, that will monitor, all right, the contents of your blood. All right, so when we're discussing our sensory pathways, our somatosensory pathways are going to carry signals from the skin because that's where a majority of, uh, of a lot of your receptors are for the somatosensory pathways, but also the muscles and joints. Well, that's gonna include proprioception. Visceral sensory pathways, of course, are gonna be from our organs, our viscera. So when we're dealing with our sensory pathways, we're gonna talk about all the neurons that are involved from the origin of the stimulus all the way up to the brain. So we're going to see, remember what I said, a lot of these pathways will have two or more neurons involved in that pathway. For our sensory pathways, we're gonna see three. You have your primary neuron, your secondary neuron, and your tertiary neuron. All right, so you're, we're gonna talk about a, a lot of these pathways, and you're going to see there's a pattern here. The primary always starts at the source of whatever the signal is going to be at the stimulus there. So we refer to that end as the peripheral ending. And if you recall, this is a unipolar type of neuron, meaning you have one cell body that, that has a process coming off the cell body with two extensions or processes. It's like a, the, the shape of a T. So here's your cell body. And you have one process that comes off and then one, it bifurcates. One process goes one way, the other one goes the other way. This one here goes out to the periphery, like your finger or your foot. And then the other one goes into your central nervous system. So the primary is gonna have the peripheral ending and the cell body is gonna be located in that posterior root ganglia. You remember that? It, that's near the spinal, spinal nerve. And then the uh, other process 
is going to be the axon that leads to the second neuron. Second neuron is also known as an interneuron. It's going to receive that information from that primary neuron, and it's going to transmit it to the tertiary neuron, which is going to be uh, a, a lot of the times going to be located in the thalamus or to the cerebellum. And then, of course, our tertiary neuron is going to receive that secondary input from the secondary neuron, and it's going to transmit that information to our somatosensory cortex, which is located in the parietal lobe. So I'd love to show you pictures, and I will here. So this picture here is showing us all, right, all the different neurons here. So our first neuron, the primary neuron, is out here in the periphery. I guess I should draw some. So if we extend our primary neuron out, you have nerve endings here, you can say like the tip of the finger. And so that will transmit that sensory input information along that primary neuron. Here you can see there's the cell body located in the dorsal root or posterior root ganglion there. And it'll transmit that information into the spinal cord. And it will then, that primary neuron will then synapse or contact the secondary neuron. And that secondary neuron is then going to ascend up into our brain and it will synapse onto the tertiary neuron. Normally that will occur in the thalamus. And the, the uh, tertiary neuron will then go to somewhere in our somatosensory cortex. So your brain and you will know, okay, what is it that I'm touching? Or what is this proprioceptive information? Or what organ is getting stretched? So let's start off with our very first sensory pathway, and that's called the posterior funiculus, also known as the medial lemniscal pathway. This should look familiar to you, all right? The medial lemniscal pathway is a conduction tract that is made up of myelinated axons, and we saw it in various places throughout the brainstem last class. So you'll see it in the medulla oblongata, you'll see it in the pons, you'll see it in the midbrain there. So the type of information that the medial lemniscal pathway carries is going to include proprioception, touch, our tactile uh, 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 sensation, pressure, and vibration. And it's going to include three neurons in the chain. That means a primary, secondary, and a tertiary. Some of these sensory pathways will only have two. This one has three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this slide, and then I'll show you all this information on a picture slide, okay? So starting with the primary neuron, again, the primary neuron always start, start, ugh, starts off in the periphery, somewhere in our skin. And so it is going to then transmit that nervous information to some, somewhere in the brainstem. Notice we say the brainstem, not a particular segment of the brainstem. All right, so here we go. Peripheral receptor, all right, is going to transmit that information along the axon. The axon is going to be found in the spinal nerve. It will then enter into your spinal cord through the posterior root. In case you forgot what the posterior root is, let's zoom in here for a quick moment. Here's the posterior root right back here. Okay, so our, here's our axon. It's transmitting that sensory information. All right, it's going to enter into your spinal cord through the posterior root. That's how um, that sensory information gets into the spinal cord. It enters into the, uh, the posterior root because that's the only type of information that is allowed to travel in that anatomical region, sensory only. All right, so it enters into the spinal cord through the posterior root. Now, once it gains entrance into the spinal cord, it's gonna to go to an area of the spinal cord called the posterior funiculus. What's that? The posterior funiculus is this area right here, this whole thing. This is the posterior funiculus. This is the anterior funiculus. This is the lateral funiculus. It's what we call the white matter in our spinal cord. Then we'll divide up the posterior funiculus 
into what we call the fascicularis gracilis and the fascicularis cuneatus. Okay, so if you look here, the fasciculus cuneatus is the orange color and the fasciculus gracilis is the green color. And so the gracilis is gonna receive sensory information from your lower extremities, all right, the lower half of your body, let's say. And then the fasciculus gracilis is going to receive sensory information from the upper portion of your body and your upper extremities. How I remember it is the gracilis muscle is located down in your leg. Easy to remember. Okay, so here we can see our primary sensory neuron comes in, enters into the spinal cord, will travel in one of these fasciculi, either in the fasciculus gracilis or the fasciculus cuneatus, depending on where that information is coming from, but from the lower part of your body or the upper part of your body. And then it'll ascend up into your brainstem, somewhere in your brainstem. All right, so it'll travel up and it will then synapse onto the secondary neuron. And that will be in either the nucleus gracilis or the nucleus cuneatus, depending on which, all right, fasciculus that it traveled in. If it traveled up through the fasciculus gracilis, then it's going to synapse on the secondary neuron in the nucleus gracilis because we just talked about it. David pointed it out to us that a nucleus is what we call a cluster of cell bodies in the central nervous system. And a cluster of cell bodies usually is going to be a, a location where we're going to see synapse. Okay, so that's what we're going to see. This neuron is going to travel up through either the fasciculus cuneatus or the fasciculus gracilis. Okay. In this case, it's going to travel up into the medulla oblongata, and it's going to synapse onto our secondary neuron. From there, okay, our secondary neuron, the cell body, is located in either one of those nuclei, either the cuneatus or the gracilis in the medulla oblongata. And here's where we're going to see all right, that sensory information decusate. It's going to cross over. So it's gonna decusate first, and then it's going to enter into the medial lumniscal pathway. And once it decusates and enters into the medial lumniscal pathway, it'll ascend all the way up to your thalamus where it will synapse onto your tertiary neuron. And then the tertiary neuron is going to relay that information to your primary somatosensory cortex that's located in the parietal lobe, specifically the postcentral gyrus. And the nice thing is, is that the thalamus is going to uh, relay that information to the appropriate area or region of the cerebrum, which in this case is our primary somatosensory cortex, but to a specific area in the postcentral gyrus. So you remember that sensory homunculus, that weird picture of how your body, all right, sees itself or how your brain sees itself? Well, that, all right, is going to be depending, uh, somewhere in that uh, motor, uh, not motor homunculus, that sensory homunculus, all right, if it's for the face, it'll be mid region there. Or if it's one of the upper or lower extremities, all right, if it's an upper extremity, that'll be more in, in, in the uh, longitudinal fissure. All right, so let's look at in a picture. I like pictures, they always help. Okay, so here's our primary uh, neuron. It's receiving that information. And you can see, look, we have receptors for touch. Discriminative touch is going to be um, that fine touch when you're able to, to determine the difference or the distance between two points. So if I were to take two, uh, I don't want to hurt you, but uh, if I were to take uh, two pens and if I were to spread them about three inches apart from each other and I were to touch them onto your skin at the exact same time, I said, does this feel like two things touching you or one thing touching you? And you say, that's two things. I said, okay, your eyes are closed when I'm doing this. I move them an inch closer to one another. I said, does this feel like two or one? And you'd still be able to tell, all right, it's two. But when I get them really, really close, 
to one another, maybe like a millimeter away, depending on how good your discriminative touch is, this, all right, um, these receptors will determine and tell that it, does it feel like one point or two points, all right? Pressure, vibration, and proprioception. All, right? all of that is gonna come all right, on our sensory, primary sensory neuron, it enters into the spinal cord, right? Enters into the posterior gray matter, goes into either the fasciculus gracilis or the fasciculus cuneatus, ascends up to the medulla oblongata, will then synapse on the secondary neuron and either the nucleus gracilis or the nucleus cuneatus. And then what we'll see is it will then cross over, it'll decusate and enter into all right, our medial lemniscus. And then it'll ascend up through the pons, through the midbrain in our medial lemniscal pathway. And it'll ascend all the way up to the thalamus in which it will then synapse on the thalamus, uh, excuse me, on the tertiary neuron. And then from there, tertiary neuron is gonna to go to the appropriate cerebral region which in this case is gonna be your primary somatosensory cortex that's located in the postcentral gyrus. And you'll be able to tell exactly what type of sensation this is and where it's coming from. And that's the medial lemniscal pathway. Pretty cool. All right, our next sensory pathway is the anterior lateral pathway. So the anterior lateral pathway carries crude touch, pressure, ooh, pain, that's important, and temperature. This again is a three neuron chain. So similar, very similar type of pattern here. The primary neuron, all right, is gonna start in the skin and it'll end in the spinal cord somewhere. So the axon is gonna come from the periphery, enter into the spinal nerve, you know this story, enters into the posterior root, right? It will then enter into the posterior horn of the spinal cord and it will synapse onto the secondary neuron. So if we look here briefly, same story, no, not same story, very similar, okay? So pain or temperature or pressure, all right, comes into, all right, the primary neuron travels into the spinal cord through the posterior root, and then it'll enter into the posterior horn here of the spinal cord, and it'll synapse on the secondary neuron. Now here with our secondary neuron, all right, it's going to relay that information from the spinal cord all the way up to our relay center, the thalamus. But here, we're going to see that the secondary neuron, much like the previous secondary neuron that we saw in the medial lemniscal pathway, it's going to decusate. It's going to cross over, but it decusates in the spinal cord, not in the brainstem, like in the medial lemniscal pathway. So this axon decusates in the spinal cord, and it's going to enter into, on the other side, either the anterior spinal thalamic tract or the lateral spinal thalamic tract. And I'm gonna break both of those individuals down right in, in a moment, okay? But just keep that in mind. It's gonna enter into either one of those tracts and ascend all the way up to the thalamus where it's going to uh, synapse onto the tertiary neuron. And then of course, you know what happens from there. The tertiary neuron is going to relay that information to the appropriate area in the cerebral cortex. Again, we're going to wind up in that primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe, which is located in the post-central gyrus. So now we're going to get a little bit uh, specific here as we talk about our anterior spinal thalamic tract in the lateral spinal thalamic tract. I'm sorry, this is bothering me. I just have to bold this. Ah, much better, okay. I don't know why that bothers me. Okay, so let's talk about 
each of these in a moment, but I just want to show you the general overall as to what happens here. All right, this is for the anterior lateral pathway. Okay, so we have our neuron enter in. Okay, it is going to enter into the into the spinal cord, synapse onto the secondary neuron. It decusates, crosses over. It'll ascend up through either the anterior or lateral spinal thalamic tract. It'll travel all the way up through the brainstem, parts of the cerebrum, and into the thalamus. And then from there, it'll synapse onto the tertiary neuron. And that tertiary neuron, tertiary neuron will then go to somewhere in our um, parietal lobe in the, in the primary somatosensory cortex there. Okay, so let's see what that means. Oh, I skipped. Oh, okay. Either or, guys. Sorry about that. I was mixing the anterior lateral pathway up with one of the motor pathways. So there isn't any more specifics on that. All right. Last sensory pathway, the spinal cerebellar pathway. This pathway deals with just two neurons in our chain. And the, the uh, sensory information is proprioception. Okay, the stretch in a joint, muscle, or the tendons of that joint. So two neurons, right, the primary neuron is going to bring that sensory information from the skin into the spinal cord. Our secondary neuron is then going to relay that information from the spinal cord right to the cerebellum. Similar uh, pathway that we saw previously, the axon is going to enter in through the spinal nerve and posterior root and gains access to the spinal cord, and it will then synapse on our secondary neuron in the posterior gray horn of your spinal cord. That secondary neuron, okay, we'll see has an option. It can either decusate and cross over, or it can remain ipsilateral. This is the first time that we're seeing something remain, remaining ipsilateral here. Okay, so, some of those sensory axons will cross, some will stay on the same side or ipsilateral. Okay, so we'll see again how this axon can, oh, this is gonna drive me crazy, right? Can ascend either through the anterior spinal cerebellar tract or the posterior spinal cerebellar tract. And then from there, all right, as it's ascending up, into the, the uh, from the spinal cord, it will then enter into the cerebellum. I hate to do this, but I have to. I don't know why that bothers me, folks. Ah, uh, better, okay. Okay, so let's take a quick peek here. I love pictures. Primary neuron, okay, getting some information from your knee or uh, your fist or wrist or elbow or whatever, that proprioceptive information telling your, your uh, central nervous system how much you're flexing or extending, abducting a specific joint. That information travels along that primary um, neuron's axon enters into the spinal cord, okay? It will then synapse onto the secondary neuron. Now that secondary neuron has two choices and that's what this drawing is showing you. All right, the secondary neuron can stay ipsilateral and descend up, or you can see how it can uh, decusate and cross over and then ascend up. Point being is it'll ascend up through all right, your brain stem, all right, either through the posterior spinal cerebellar tract or the anterior spinal cerebellar tract, and then it will then go into the cerebellum here. And that's going to provide, all right, the cerebellum, as you recall, the cerebellum is that fine-tuned corrective movement, memory storing, or at least muscle memory storing, all right, structure, all right, one of the regions of your brain. So all that information will then be transmitted to that area of the brain so you can have much more smooth movements there, especially when we're dealing with proprioception. 
All right, so that was the sensory pathways. What about some of our motor pathways? Our motor pathways are gonna be the descending pathways. This is where we're going to be dealing with effectors, okay, effectors. And as you know, effectors are either muscles or glands. And so we're gonna talk about our skeletal muscles. Those will be our somatic uh, uh, effectors. Okay, now when we're dealing with motor pathways, we, we will have at least two neurons at all times. And so we call those upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. Our upper motor neuron is going to be found either in the motor cortex. If you recall the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex was in the frontal lobe there in the precentral gyrus. Also that upper motor neuron can originate in one of our cerebral nuclei or in one of the nuclei in our brainstem. And normally if it's a nuclei in the brainstem, right, in some cases it will be a cranial nerve nuclei. Not always though. And so the upper motor neuron will then synapse onto our lower motor neuron. And so our lower motor neuron is gonna be a cranial nerve nucleus or it will be found in the spinal cord in the anterior horn. And the lower motor neuron will be excitatory. So where's the anterior horn? Just to review, here's the anterior horn right there. Back here, posterior horn. Where's the motor normally in your car? It's in the front, okay? So anterior horn is where the motor neurons are going to be exiting out of the spinal cord into the spinal nerve. So I just remember the motors in the front. So the first motor pathway is what we call the direct or the pyramidal pathway. And so this is where we're gonna be dealing with, all right, the skeletal muscles. So we're gonna talk about how these neurons descend from the motor cortex out to the effector organs, the skeletal muscles here. So our upper motor neuron is going to originate in the primary motor cortex. That is the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. It's going to descend down through the white matter of the cerebrum, that's called the internal capsule. And then once it gains entrance into the, um, to the brainstem, it'll travel down through the cerebral peduncles. And I'm sure if you don't remember those, we saw those in the anterior portion of the midbrain. And then it'll go into what we call our cortical spinal tracts. And they'll descend down through the spinal cord until it gets to a certain level, depending on what skeletal muscle you're gonna innervate. Obviously, if it's a skeletal muscle, let's say in your upper extremity, right, it doesn't have to descend as far. If it's a skeletal muscle in your lower extremity, then it has to descend a little bit further in the spinal cord. It'll descend and then it will synapse onto the lower motor neuron in the anterior horn. And then from there, that lower motor neuron is gonna go out to the end organ, which is our skeletal muscle. So here's what it looks like. <clears throat> okay, starting here at the origin, right, the cell body of our upper motor neuron here in our primary motor cortex. It descends down here through the internal capsule right, and it'll enter into the brain stem, travel down through the brain stem all the way to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Synapse onto the lower motor neuron, that lower motor neuron will then exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior roots because only motor axons are allowed here. And then it'll enter into the spinal nerve and then exit out uh, well, travel through the spinal nerve out to the specific area uh, of whatever the skeletal muscle it's going to innervate. Okay, so there's this is the pathway that I was uh, thinking about. Sorry about that from earlier. All right, there's two types of direct pyramidal pathways here. We have the lateral cortical spinal tracts and the anterior cortical spinal tracts tracks. I'll do the lateral first, show you the pictures, then we'll come back and do the anterior. All right, here we go. 
Similar, similar, similar. The upper motor neuron will begin in the, in the primary motor cortex. It will descend down to the brainstem. Here is where that axon will decusate. Remember the pyramids there of the medulla oblongata? If you don't, you should know that, okay? Go back and review your notes, okay? The pyramids are going to be where the upper motor neurons are going to cross over and decusate. Once they do, right, they will enter into the lateral funiculi, right? Dr. Cos, I have no idea what the lateral funiculi is. No problem, that's what I'm here for. Here is your spinal cord, or at least the best picture that I can do. The lateral funiculi is this white matter here on the side. God, I hate when it does that. It's the white matter on the side there of our gray matter. All right, so the lateral cortical spinal tract will be found in the lateral funiculi. And it'll descend down, and then it'll synapse onto the lower motor neuron. And then that lower motor neuron, okay, will exit out, same situation, will exit out of the spinal cord and go out to your extremity. Now, for the lateral cortical spinal tract, okay, it's going to innervate right, muscles located in your limbs for more precision movements or what we call skilled movements, All right? So this is gonna to go to those limb muscles, those appendicular muscles. Think of all those muscles that we talked about uh, at the end of chapter 11, when I was discussing like the dorsal interossei in your fingers, all right? Some of the lumbricals, those smaller uh, muscles, even some of the forearm muscles there, okay? So th these lower motor neurons are gonna innervate those limb muscles there. So let's take a peek. We'll start off at the top, we'll work our way down. All right, so starting on the left side of the body here, okay, we are going to, I wanna make sure I'm looking at the right one. Okay, here's the lateral. Okay, so our upper motor neuron starts off in the primary motor cortex, descends down through the internal capsule, makes its way to the midbrain here, or the brainstem, travels down until we get to the medulla oblongata. Then the neuron here will decusate and cross over. Okay, the lateral cortical spinal tract, those neurons cross over or decusate in the pyramids or the medulla of the medulla oblongata. So they'll cross over, descend down through the spinal cord, through here's this is the lateral funiculus here. Okay, it'll, it'll descend down through the lateral cortical spinal tract located in the lateral funiculus. And then it will synapse onto the lower motor neuron. Now, this is showing you, see that little blue guy there? That's just an inner neuron. Remember, right? Motor tracts will have at least two neurons. They can have more, but they'll have at least two. So this is just showing you. All right, our upper motor neuron synapsing onto an inner neuron, and then that inner neuron synapsing onto our uh, lower motor neuron. Point being is, the lower motor neuron is located here in the anterior horn, and then it will exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior roots into the spinal cord and out to that specific skeletal muscle that's located in your limb for whatever skilled movement that you need it for painting maybe, drawing a picture, whatever. Okay, that is the motor pathway for the lateral cortical spinal tract. The anterior cortical spinal tract, same scenario, originates up in the primary motor cortex, descends down, all right, through the white matter there into the brainstem. This time it does not cross over. It stays ipsilateral. It's going to cross over in the spinal cord. So it descends down, all right, through the spinal cord in the anterior funiculi. That's this part, the white matter in the front. Right. <clears throat> so it's going to descend down through the anterior funiculi. It'll get to a specific level of the spinal cord, depending on what it's going to innervate. All right. At a specific level of the spinal cord, it will then cross over at that level. 
And then it will either synapse onto an inner neuron or the lower motor neuron directly. And then that lower motor neuron will then exit out, same story, will exit out of the spinal cord and it will innervate, in this case, axial skeletal muscles. Well, those are those muscles that we learned at the beginning of chapter 11, okay? All those fun muscles like the pectoralis major, all right, or some of those other muscles that we saw, right, the erector spiner, yada, 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 okay, the axial muscles there. All right, let's pull back here, show you. Okay, so here's our upper motor neuron originating in the primary motor cortex on the left side of our cerebral hemisphere. It descends down through the internal capsule, goes down into the brainstem, through the midbrain, through the pons, through the medulla oblongata. It does not cross over. It does not decusate here. All right, so it'll, it'll go down through right, the anterior cortical spinal tract all the way down through the spinal cord to a specific level through to a specific level and then that motor neuron will then decusate at that specific cord level and it'll synapse onto either an inner neuron or a lower motor neuron found here all right that lower motor neuron the cell body is located in the anterior horn and the same thing the anterior horn will or excuse me, that lower motor neuron will exit out of the spinal cord and go out to the skeletal muscles. Right, that's the cortical spinal tracts, the lateral and the anterior cortical spinal tract. All right, so those are our direct pathways or the pyramidal pathways. Now we have a couple indirect pathways. So the nice thing is about the indirect pathways, I'm not going to have you learn all those. I just want to point them out because there's a lot of, of nerves that are involved that are, are, that are associated with the indirect pathway. So what we'll see with an indirect pathway, we're going to see the upper motor neuron, okay, is going to originate not in the cerebral cortex, right, but in the brainstem nuclei. And then it goes through, again, it's a complicated uh, a route, but just know that it originates in the brainstem nuclei and it's going to make its way through the spinal cord. So we have the lateral pathways and the medial pathways. All right? Lateral pathways are going to be for precision movement and tone in our flexor limb muscles. Flexor limb muscles. So this includes the rubral spinal. So yeah rubrospinal tract in our brains and our midbrain. I'm going to say brainstem. Same thing, except this is specific. The medial pathways, there's three of them. There's the reticular spinal, the tectal spinal, and the vestibular spinal, but they're going to re regulate muscle tone and movements of our head, neck, and the proximal limbs and your trunk. That's the medial pathway. So those three, the reticular spinal, the tectal spinal, and the vestibular spinal. The reticular spinal deals with the reticular formation. Well, that we learned about the reticular formation. The reticular formation is a sensory and a motor component. Right? This has to do, obviously, with the motor component. So this is going to control reflexes for our posture and balance. You're using that right now. The tectal spinal track deals with those bumps that we saw in the midbrain, the superior and in, in the inferior colliculi. Superior has to do with visual reflexes and tracking. The inferior colliculi has to do with auditory reflexes. And then finally, our vestibular spinal track, right? This is utilized here for balance, while you are using, again, while you're here sitting, at least I am, sitting, standing, and walking. Hence vestibulo, which is like the vestibular system, but not, don't, that's how I remembered it. Okay, it's not going to be technically involved with um, the vestibular system in regards to balance, because balance is a very general term. All right, spinal cord injuries. There's been a lot of research that's been done with this. I haven't heard anything too much lately, um, but 
considering what actually, you know, the last time that I had heard anything about a spinal cord injury, I did a mud run here in Greenville, South Carolina. And it must've been about eight, eight, nine years ago. If you've ever done a mud run, you know, pretty money, muddy. Um, and it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Well, anyways, uh, there was a person that was uh, running on the first obstacle. You essentially have to dive into this mud pit and crawl under uh, these logs that are uh, like a foot or two off the ground. Well, this person decided to dive in head first and they misjudged it and they didn't clear it. Anyways, they injured their neck, ended up being paralyzed. And so in this situation, depending on the extent of the injury, individuals can be paralyzed, has to do with the location of the damage in the spinal cord. And in some cases, if you're paralyzed, um, um, I won't say it's life-threatening, but it could be temporary, it could be permanent. Again, it depends on the severity, but paralyzed has to do with motor control, and then also don't forget, there's the sensory part of it. So in some situation, um, these patients or, or people might not be able to perceive certain sensations. And so um, they might have um, anesthesia. I couldn't think of the term there. I was struggling for that word, right? They might have anesthesia, which is a lack of sensation. So normally in this type of situation, if the person is injured, we have to try to control the swelling. How do we do it? We give them lots of steroids. Um, there's a new technique. When I say new, I don't even know if they're still using it, but they tried it out. A Buffalo Bills football player got injured in a game. This was 15 years ago, I want to say. And um, what had happened, he sustained a neck injury in a game, and they took him to a local hospital, and they gave him steroids. Not only that, they infused ice-cold saline into his spinal column, right there in that vertebral column, not the vertebral column, the spinal column where the spinal cord resides. And that helped to reduce the inflammation along with the steroids. And he actually recovered. Now he's not playing football anymore, but he's able to walk, which is a huge thing. They also gave him antibiotics. Okay, obviously that's gonna decrease the, the chances of infections. Right, and now they're messing around with stem cells and seeing, again, um, if it can help to regenerate central nervous system axons, which we saw when we were going over chapter 12. Usually, if there's damage to uh, any of the neurons in the central nervous system, the glial cells interfere with that and form scar tissue. And a lot of times, um, we can't regenerate that tissue. But the neural stem cells we're seeing are being helpful in that regeneration of tissue. All right, spinal nerve branches, love them. We'll go over this a little bit more in detail, but here you can see, all right, here's the spinal cord. And then you can see our spinal nerve that is exiting out of our vertebral column here. And we have a little branch coming off of our spinal nerve. That first branch is called the posterior ramus. It goes back to innervate, all right, your deep uh, muscles of the back and the skin along your back. Then what will happen is at that point, the remaining part of this nerve is referred to as the anterior ramus. So right when that first branch comes off, it's known as the spinal nerve right here. Then when you get this little tiny branch coming off the posterior ramus, then, the, then we don't call it a spinal nerve anymore. We call it the anterior ramus. And we'll learn more about the anterior ramus and all that when we uh, in lab, not today. You'll see you have these two little uh, branches that come off the spinal nerve over here, and they connect to this structure here called the sympathetic trunk ganglion. Now, the sympathetic trunk ganglion is this neurological structure that will uh, sit in close proximity to your vertebral column. So this is my best attempt at, a, at, your, at your spine. Here are the discs. These lines represent the discs, okay? And just outside of the vertebral column on either side, you have what's known as the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain. And all along the sympathetic chain, you'll have these little bulges on it. And those are the ganglia. So you know what's, you know what's in a ganglia. All right, 
So the whole thing is called the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain. If we're talking about the bulge there, we're referring to that as the sympathetic trunk ganglion. So we'll talk more about its role later on when we get into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So of course, spinal nerves are mixed nerves and they carry both motor and sensory information. So when we're dealing with sensory information, we have to talk about dermatomes. And the dermatomes are gonna be a specific area of skin that's supplied by a specific single spinal nerve. So let me show you a picture. See this map here, this is our dermatome map. You can see this guy has got all these numbers written all over him. Those numbers represent the spinal nerve that is responsible for sensory innervation to that specific area of the body. So I use it all the time. If someone says, hey, I've got numbness tingling in my right hand. And so I say, okay, where? The whole hand. Okay. So I don't have to look at the map anymore because I've memorized it, but I look at the map. I see, all right, C5, C7, and C8. Those spinal nerves, something's going on with those spinal nerves to cause numbness and tingling in the hand. So I would then be thinking, all right, in the, in the neck here, again, we'll talk more about this in lab, right? I would start to think, all right, the spinal nerves in the neck, something may be going on there, because I'll, I'll start there. So maybe I'd order an MRI to see if there was a disc herniation or multiple disc herniations that are pressing on those spinal nerves that are causing numbness and tingling in the hand. All right, I might think carpal tunnel. Something's pinching over here. There's a whole a variety of things. But these dermatome maps help us, all right, to understand, okay, where the sensory innervation is occurring on the skin and we can correlate it to which spinal nerve. So for example, when we're talking about the umbilicus, that's gonna be the T10 dermatome. We go back to our map here, all right, a common one is gonna be the T4, that's the nipple line. The xiphoid process will be T7. Okay, so just the common examples, just common examples. All right, so this helps us to determine if there's damage to one or more spinal nerves there. All right, this also leads us into referred pain. Perfect example, heart attack. Heart attack, heart attack, people get freaked out. All right, they get chest pain and their left arm, okay, will start to have pain. This is our uh, referred pain or what we call referred visceral pain. And basically, all right, the nerves that are going to um, innervate your heart, right, for heart rate and whatnot and, and other functions of the heart will piggyback or share the same spinal nerve. So they all go to the same area there, so you'll get the same pain. For example, appendicitis, you can see here, the T10 dermatomes around your belly button. But normally, all right, if anybody's ever had appendicitis, you know what I'm talking about, it will migrate to one side. It usually starts off, I shouldn't say usually, the early signs, and most people don't pay attention to it because it's right around the, the, uh, the belly button, the umbilicus there, but then it will migrate over to the right side, right over the appendix there. So sometimes they'll have this pain here, right, and then it will migrate to the left, or excuse me, to the right, and um, we refer to that as um, Preferred pain. Folks that have gallbladder issues will sometimes get right shoulder pain. Same type of scenario. Shingles. Oh my gosh. Hopefully, all right, none of us have ever experienced shingles. I never have, right? But shingles, here's our first clinical view of the day, is one of our, um, uh, uh, well, right around, the, well, I think it's year round now that I think about it. Uh, shingles has to do with chicken pox. Same virus. And in fact, Right? If you've never had the chicken pox, you won't have shingles because here's what happens. The virus is called the varicella zoster virus. And so you get your case of chicken pox. Right? Back in the day, we used to get it without the, the vaccine for it. You get it naturally, have a chicken pox party. Everybody would get it. Yeah, you'd all go home, scratch for a week or two, and then eventually you get over it. Well, here's the problem. The virus never goes away. Okay. 
It likes to lay dormant in the posterior root ganglia. Well, that's not cool. Well, that's what happens, folks. So it lies dormant there. And what will happen when you get a, a, a shingles uh, 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 activation is the virus then becomes reactivated and it'll travel down through the spinal nerve, through the sensory axons to a specific dermatome. So you'll see, you can tell which spinal nerve it is by looking at your dermatome map and you'll see, okay, this um, configuration of some redness or a rash and these blisters along a specific dermatome. I've seen it a lot um, in the thorax in the, in, the, in the back region there. Uh, I've met somebody that had it on their eye, which is really crazy, okay? It can be intense burning pain, right? And so of course we give them some antivirals depending on how bad it is. Uh, we can give them some steroids to help with the pain, right? And of course we now have a vaccine to help prevent that, which is good. Okay, the last topic that I want to talk about are our reflexes. So this is really important, folks, because if you understand reflexes, you're going to understand a lot of the systemic uh, or the system reviews in Bio 211. Okay, because like the digestive system relies heavily on certain types of visceral reflexes. So let's talk about what a reflex is. Okay, for most of us, we already know. Right? When you go into the doctor and they take that hammer and they hit you in the knee and your leg jumps out, that's a reflex. That's a spinal reflex. So that's rapid. It's pre-programmed, which means it's always going to be the same. Every time you elicit that reflex, it'll be the same. It's involuntary. That's good. Okay, Life or death situation requires that. So what we'll, we'll see is right, when we initiate a reflex, okay, it will elicit an involuntary response to one of our effector organs. Okay, that's going to be muscles and glands. And so in order to start this whole thing off, we need a stimulus. You can't have a reflex unless you have a stimulus. So the stimulus is required. Right? Once the stimulus is required, then we're going to have a rapid response to whatever it is. And the fewer neurons you have in that neuron chain, the quicker the response will be. So if you have four neurons, all right, That'll be fast, but if you only have two neurons, that'll be faster. Less synapses. Think about everything that goes on in a synapse. We got to release the synaptic vesicles, then we got to wait for the neurotransmitter to diffuse across the synaptic clock. Well, if we have fewer synapses, we don't have to waste our time with all that stuff. Okay, like I said, it's pre programmed, it'll always be the same. And of course, it'll be involuntary. And so you might not even know that the reflex happened until it's already happened. So one of the ways that has gotten us this far is that it helps, uh, helps us out as a survival mechanism here. All right, so this is a great picture here. All right, this explains what we call the reflex arc. So our stimulus in this picture is going to be, all right, this pin. And it sticks in, into your finger, let's say. You're reaching out to grab something, all right? You accidentally uh, stick yourself with the pin. It stimulates the pain receptors here in your skin. It sends that sensory input right up into the spinal nerve, into our posterior root, and it goes into the spinal cord. Then it'll synapse onto a neuron. And then in this picture here, you're seeing how this neuron, this is an inner neuron. The inner neuron will then synapse onto a motor neuron, and then it'll trigger and activate that motor neuron Right, to stimulate the effector. And in this case, it's going to uh, affect, it's going to stimulate the biceps brachii muscle to pull your hand away from that pin there. Whereas you notice the inner neuron has a collateral here. Remember, axons can have branches, and that collateral, that branch goes up to the brain, and that'll inform your brain hey, you just poked yourself with something. That's, and, but it takes time. So usually your awareness comes after the fact. All right, so we classify our reflexes a couple different ways. We're going to be talking about spinal reflexes today. All right, so we have either spinal reflexes or cranial reflexes. And it just determines, all right, whether or not we're utilizing the spinal cord or the brain. If the brain's involved, it's a cranial reflex. 
If the spinal cord is involved, it's a spinal reflex. That's all that it means. Somatic versus visceral. If it's a somatic reflex, our effector is skeletal muscle. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. If it's a visceral reflex, that's going to involve all right, involuntary effectors, which is cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Guess what? You get to learn about all of that in 211. If you understand this concept now, I'm telling you, it'll all make sense. All right, spinal reflexes, or not spinal reflexes, but reflexes can also be monosynaptic or polysynaptic. Monosynaptic means we only have two neurons in our reflex arc, all right? One synapse, fast, okay? Polysynaptic is going to be two or more, slower than a monosynapse. Ipsilateral, contralateral, right? If they're ipsilateral, both the receptor and the effector are on the same side of the body. If it's contralateral, opposite sides. And then finally, innate or acquired. Innate means you're born with it, okay? Acquired develops after birth. So there's gonna be certain ones, and doctors do it all the time on babies. I do it whenever I get an infant in my practice. All right, I'm always doing a lot of those innate reflexes to check to see how the baby's doing. All right, so here's a nice picture of a monosynaptic reflex versus a polysynaptic. Here you are. Here's the synapse, one single synapse, right? Direct communication from our sensory neuron to the motor neuron. In our polysynaptic reflex, we're going to be involving uh, one or more inner neurons. Takes a little bit longer. Okay, so for our spinal reflexes, there's four that I'm gonna go over here, okay? So we have the stretch reflex, our Golgi tendon reflex, the withdrawal reflex, and their crossed extensor reflex. Now, the first two, the stretch reflex and the Golgi tendon reflex, has to do with proprioceptors. So that means we're going to be dealing with muscles, all right, and joints. So our proprioceptor that we're going to use uh, in our uh, stretch reflex and the Golgi tendon reflex, we call that proprioceptor a muscle spindle. And it basically is going to monitor the amount of stretch that's going on in a muscle that is normally going to be um, associated with a joint. So let's describe what a muscle spindle is. And to do that, I'm going to show you a picture. Okay, so let's zoom in. Here's our muscle fiber. There's two types. You have the extrafusal muscle fiber and the intrafusal muscle fiber. This whole structure is going to be our muscle spindle here, right here. See that? All right, so the extrafusal muscle fiber is the big portion, the intrafusal muscle fiber is inside. Now, if you look here at, the, at our muscle spindle, the intrafusal muscle fibers, right, it's just a small grouping of muscle fibers, you can see this blue structure just intertwined throughout. That's your sensory neuron there, okay? So it's got its little receptors all throughout, and it's constantly monitoring the shape and the stretch that's occurring on um, the muscle fibers here. Then you'll also notice we have a couple other different types of neurons here, right? We've got an alpha motor neuron and a gamma motor neuron. What is that? An alpha motor neuron, uh, or motor nerve, I should say, is going to, alpha are the largest types of nerves. So they're going to have much quicker uh, action potential conduction. All right, gamma are smaller. All right, so that's what we're dealing here with when we're talking about our muscle spindle, right? So we have our intrafusal muscle fibers, right? Which are gonna be innervated by our gamma motor neurons. All right, so what happens is, right? When a muscle is being stretched, right? That muscle spindle, those sensory neurons are gonna be firing action potentials to the spinal cord to let the spinal cord know what's happening here. So let's discuss this. All right, so you're stretching, or say someone's trying to run by you and you reach your arm out to try to stop them. And they're not stopping and they keep going and they keep going and they're stretching your arm muscles out. And in this case, right, the example is the triceps brachii muscle, so I'll use that. So you put your arm out there and they're getting by you and, you're, and they're stretching your triceps brachii muscle out. So those sensory receptors there are going to bombard your spinal cord with sensory information saying, hello, this muscle is getting stretched. And that's what happens. 
all right? Our muscle spindle is gonna detect that stretch. And so the sensory neurons are gonna fire and send that information to the spinal cord. Right? So that information enters into the spinal cord and it's gonna stimulate our alpha motor neurons, the big guys. And so what's gonna happen is the alpha motor neurons are gonna transmit that nerve information to the end organ, the effector organ, which is skeletal muscle, the triceps brachii muscle. And so it's gonna stimulate the triceps brachii muscle to contract, All right? That is a monosynaptic reflex because there's only two uh, neur neurons involved, the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. So let's take a peek because there's more involved in here in this, but I'll show you real fast. Okay. So here's our triceps brachii muscle. It gets stretched too much. That activates all right, our muscle spindle here. And the sensory nerve endings are going to transmit that sensory input here on the sensory neuron into the spinal cord. And so what we'll, what we'll see is that sensory neuron will directly synapse onto our alpha motor neuron. And it will then cause that alpha motor neuron to send information or nerve signal to the triceps brachii muscle. And it will stimulate the triceps brachii muscle to contract. So it's no longer being stretched. So it stops it from being stretched. Okay, that's the first part. If you look here at your arm, you've got muscles on the back of the arm and muscles on the front of the arm. All right, the muscles on the back of the arm in this scenario are what we call agonist muscles. So if you were to straighten your elbow, these muscles would shorten. Antagonistic muscles are muscles that have the opposite or they'll oppose the action of the agonist muscles. So real simple, the triceps brachii muscle straightens your elbow, the biceps brachii muscles bend your elbow. So the biceps brachii muscles do the exact opposite in this scenario when we're talking about the elbow to um, the triceps brachii. So this muscle bends it, this straightens it. So here's what's going on in our reflex, All right? We're trying to, to um, straighten the elbow out because we don't want these muscles to stretch anymore. But we wanna make sure in order to do that the best way possible, we need to shut these muscles off, All right? They're relaxed, but we wanna make sure they don't come online anytime during this reflex. So we're gonna inhibit them. How do we do that? Well, here's how. At the same time as we're trying to contract the, bi the triceps brachii muscle, all right? That same sensory neuron is now going to stimulate an inner neuron. And that inner neuron is going to inhibit the motor neurons for the antagonistic muscle group, right? That is what we call reciprocal inhibition. So that's what we're doing here. We want to shut off the biceps brachii muscle so it doesn't oppose our action. So the sensory neuron comes here, stimulates the inner neuron. That inner neuron is going to inhibit the alpha motor neurons that go to the biceps brachii muscle takes this muscle offline. So this muscle can contract without any opposition to protect it from being stretched too far, from tearing those muscle fibers. All right, so that's our uh, spinal reflex for stretch. What about our spinal reflex when a muscle contracts too much? Well, we call that the tendon reflex or the Golgi tendon reflex. So what's uh, our Golgi tendon organs are our proprioceptors. And so we find those pretty much where the muscle and the tendons join one another. And so their job is to monitor the amount of tension that is going on in those muscles and tendons. And so what happens is, right, when these muscles start to contract, we increase the tension. But this reflex is we want to stop a muscle from contracting too much. Because again, we're trying to prevent tissue damage. So in this scenario, okay, our sensory neurons 
are now going to send information. They're going to send information all right, from that muscle tendon area to the spinal cord. So in this example, all right, we're going to talk about what happens when the hamstrings, all right, I'm sorry, when the um, quadriceps are contracting too much. What's the action of the quadriceps? Their job is to straighten the knee, to extend the knee. So here's what's going on. These muscles are contracting too much. So we need to shut that off. Well, here's what happens. All right, the Golgi tendon organ, all right, monitors that excess tension. It sends that sensory information to the spinal cord. And what we'll see is, all right, that sensory neuron will uh, synapse and it will activate an inner neuron. That inner neuron is going to inhibit the alpha motor neuron that's going to the quadriceps femoris muscle. So it shuts it off. Okay. But we're still in that contracted state. So we need, all right, to lengthen this muscle out. No problem. That same sensory neuron is going to stimulate another inner neuron. And that other inner, inner neuron is going to activate an alpha motor neuron to the antagonistic muscle group. In this case, it's the hamstrings. The hamstrings will be activated and it will bend the knee and that will start to lengthen the quadriceps femoris. So we've shut it off and now we're going to relieve that tension by stretching the muscle a little bit. So that's what we're seeing here, okay? So that um, sensory neuron is going to activate the inner neurons that will then inhibit the motor neurons for the muscle that's contracting too much. That causes the muscle to relax. Where at the same time, right, that same sensory neuron is also going to excite another inner neuron which will excite another motor neuron to the antagonistic muscle group. And so the antagonistic muscle group will contract and we call that reciprocal activation, okay? On the previous reflex, that was called reciprocal inhibition because we're shutting off the antagonistic muscle group. In this scenario, we are undergoing reciprocal activation. We are stimulating or activating the antagonistic muscle group to contract. All right, I wanna keep going, but I'm gonna stop here for right now. As much as I would love to stay on this. And um, let's 